Well, let's consider the transmit filter. We'll talk about this in uh, kind of a couple different stages sort of leading up to the general idea. Let me begin by first establishing a front panel control for each of our primary inputs. The first would be the desired signal levels that need to be transmitted. And the second is another array that defines the pulse shape. By the way, that's not the only way to go about creating those controls. I'm illustrating a method that's based on working within the block diagram first. You could also accomplish similar results by working from the front panel directly. Let's go ahead and get these aligned. And uh, let's also consider now the this this notion of the pulse shape that somehow needs to get associated with each one of the the values in our signal levels in array now I just want to illustrate a specific shape when you do this yourself uh, you don't want you don't need to specify a default value like this but just to give us something to talk about, let me put in some values that will define a, a somewhat rounded looking pulse. And let's just take a quick look at those values as a graph. All right. Now, as it turns out, we can use an FIR filter suitably driven by a train of impulses to essentially keep generating that pulse shape as many times as needed. Let's look at the FIR filter sub VI in a little bit more detail. We see the inbound signal is X. The FIR coefficients are specified here. We generate the filtered version as the output. Now to get a little better sense of how this FIR filter can be useful, let's consider driving the FIR filter with just a single impulse and then we'll use the pulse shape as the FIR coefficients. And let's see what impulse pattern does for us. It requires some number of samples. It needs an amplitude and then uh, potentially a delay. And then it generates an impulse pattern here. Now the pattern is a single impulse. So we specify total number of samples to generate. Default is 128. Let's shrink that up just a little bit to 16. And then the delay specifies when that impulse actually occurs. So let's see how we're doing so far. All right, 16 samples generated total. If we adjust the, the delay a little bit, we should see that the pulse is likewise delayed. So I'm simply changing the, the point at which the impulse actually occurs. And so our pulse, since it's symmetrical, is centered at the location of that, that inbound impulse. Now what we'd like to do is be able to associate each value in the signals or signal levels input array with one of these pulses. So the other critical sub VI is upsample. Upsample says take some incoming values. We have an ups, upsampling factor, and that generates this upsampled array. Now to get a better sense of, of what this one does, let's apply a few 
values from signal levels in. So we think we think of signal levels in as as somehow indicating what is the amplitude of each one of the total pulses that we're trying to generate. So just to make this simple, let me specify amplitudes of one, two, and three. And I'll go ahead and create another waveform graph so we can just look at the result of the upsample sub VI. Now that seems a little bit unexpected. Let's actually reveal the sample points themselves. And we see that we have a sample at one, another at two, and another at three. So again, the, the con connecting line here is really not indicating any valid data. It's just to help the eye. Now let's see what upsampling factor does for us. Right now it's one, so if we set this to two, what we see here is that we've now inserted zeros between each of our values. So we have one, zero, two, zero, three, zero. If we continue to raise this value, now we see that we've got a uh, signal level with some intervening number of zeros. And this is how we can accomplish the spacing that's required between each of the pulses that's, or the shaped pulses that are being generated by the FIR filter. So this works out pretty nice. We see each one of these incoming impulses generates its own pulse shape. The amplitude works out properly. And in fact, the nice thing here is that if the impulses were actually spaced more closely than the total shape of our pulse, everything works out great. So you'll need to do a little bit of work to figure out the actual spacing based on duration and sampling frequency. And now I'll make a few comments about the waveform data type. The sub-VI specifications ask you to use the waveform data type for both input and output. So begin with the get waveform components node. It's easy to make a front panel control for that. If you pull this down to expose other attributes, pick the one called DT, abbreviation for delta time. Anytime that you need the sampling frequency inside your own uh, sub-VI, go ahead and just do a reciprocal operation on that, and now you've got the sampling frequency associated with that waveform in units of hertz. The nice thing about waveform data, data type here is that you're, you're bundling together the array of your signal with the timing information, in this case, the sampling frequency. Now, just by way of illustration here, I'll use the quick scale as my operation that's going on inside this sub-VI that operates on the double 1D array. As I, then as you've generated something that needs to be sent as an output, use the build waveform array node and I'll show you a couple different ways of doing this. One is to do similar to what you did before, expose the attribute for delta time, and simply connect that back to your original delta time that you knew about. So now you're able to create a waveform by bundling those two pieces of information together. An alternative method that sometimes works nicely is if you already have a waveform that's very close to what you need, in this case, of course, it has the correct delta time associated with it, then you can simply wire that to the top of your uh, build waveform, and then when you wire in the value for Y, it simply replaces the signal with your new signal. Creating an indicator is likewise easy.